Well, I'm glad that you, I'm glad that the peanut gallery over here decided to throw two cents worth things. I've got a story about Rod this morning to start uh, my message. Rod Norris walks into a bar. Now this, by the way, this is pre-Christian Rod Norris. He's not walking with the Lord at the time. So this is a story that I picked up somewhere in my own mind. Rod Norris walks into a bar pre-Christian days. He finds a preacher there offering to pray for anyone. Rod gets in line and the preacher says, what can I do for you? Rod replies, preacher, I need you to pray for help with my hearing. Exactly. The preacher puts one finger in Rod's ear and he prays the storm with all of his might, quoting scripture, spit flying. Finally, the preacher asks Rod the question, how is your hearing now? Rod says, I don't know, Reverend. It's not until Wednesday. <laughs> Where's Ben? Where's Ben? You should have, boom, on that one. It was worth it, you boom. Hey, we've been talking the last few weeks uh, about the topic of hearing uh, God's voice. And uh, the first week we had a look at the fact that God by nature is a communicator, that God speaks to us. Uh, Last week we began to look at 10 possible reasons why you may be struggling to hear the voice of God. And uh, last week we began with the first three of those and I've actually got a piece of, where did I put that piece of paper? There we go, so I, I could just quickly recap. So the first one we looked at last week was you don't believe it's possible to hear God. The second reason we looked at was you don't know what God sounds like. And we talked a bit about that. The third one was that you are hearing, but maybe you're afraid to acknowledge that what you're hearing may possibly be God. I want to take that a little bit further today and let's get into a few more of these. Before we do, I just want to point out uh, a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and uh, verse 2. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 2 says this, Paul's writing to the Corinthian believers, they had converted from their pagan religions and so on, come across and had adopted the Christian faith. They heard the story of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, They had seen signs, wonders and miracles. If you read uh, 1 and 2 Corinthians, the two letters that were written to that group of believers, uh, it's very clear that there was a lot of miraculous and supernatural stuff going on there. Um, They were very acquainted with the fact that they weren't just giving their life to some kind of Uh, philosophy or new way of thinking but they were giving their life to a God that was active and intimate and engaging and at work in not only their own lives but the world around them and Paul writes this to them in 1 Corinthians 12 too he says you know that when you were pagans when you were far from God worshipping other gods somehow or another you were influenced and led astray to mute idols mute idols that word mute there in the Greek it literally means voiceless dumb and without the faculty of speech and the point he's making here is once upon a time you worshiped statues and things made of men's hands and all kinds of that weren't God that weren't gods that didn't communicate with you like God does and he's making a bit of a contrast here going these things you used to worship they were just dumb dead dormant things but now you're worshiping a God that actually has a voice Now you worship a God that actually communicates, desires to communicate, wants to communicate, and does communicate with you. So one of the big distinctions, if you go back and look at ancient religions, and actually most religions between the Christian religion and most other world religions, one of the biggest differences is that we actually have a God that speaks. We have a God that communicates, not not a dead God. We have a God, Jesus claimed to, uh, the, the claim of the early church was that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. We're here today because I don't know all of you in your heart, but I'm assuming that we all believe that collectively. And that when Jesus went, he said, I'm going to send another one, the helper, the Holy Spirit, he'll come, he'll speak, he'll guide you in the truth, he'll take of what's mine and make it known to you. And so it's very clear that the God that we serve is a communicating God. And so I want to move on this morning and just look at uh, point reason number four, five, six, and hopefully reason number seven. So we're going to cover four reasons this morning, possible reasons why maybe you're struggling to hear the voice of God. So number one was you don't believe it's possible. Number two, you don't know what he sounds like. Number three, you are hearing, but you're afraid to acknowledge that it might be him. And number four, God's not silent. He's just not communicating the way you want him to. Maybe God's not silent, maybe God is speaking, but maybe he's just not speaking to you right now the way that you want him to speak to you. How many of you know that we live in a day and an age with a plethora of communication options, isn't there? There's all kinds of different ways that we can communicate with one another. Um, My favourite mode of communication is face-to-face. I prefer, anyone like me, you prefer face-to-face communication yes, yes. I like to be able to see what's going on when I'm talking to Russell on the phone, he could be have me on loudspeaker while he's playing polo or whatever and completely ignoring everything I've got to say. Uh, But obviously he didn't ignore me the other day when I invited him to drive three days to come to church because he did it. 
But I don't know what's going on when I'm not talking to you face-to-face. So I prefer uh, face-to-face communication. I read a story recently about a, a man that rang up a medical practice and got the receptionist online. And the receptionist called the doctor and said, Doctor, there's a man on line one. He claims to be invisible. And the doctor just simply said, Just tell him I can't see him. That was for you, Rod. But we all have different communication preferences and ways that we like to communicate. Young people love to communicate with you. See, young people with the... um, I'm surprised they don't have muscular thumbs, like a big bulge in the thumb there, because that's basically the the, the muscle that gets used a lot by them. But they love to communicate via social media. Ever seen kids on a bus? I've seen kids sitting on buses and trains in Brisbane, and they're sitting next to each other, and they're communicating. And you would assume, as an older person, you're talking to somebody in a far, far distant land, but they're talking to the person sitting next to them, you know? Really? Come on. But there's all kinds of different communication methods and styles in the world in which we live today. But mankind, I hate to break it to all the tech gurus out there that just may happen to dial in to a rise online this morning from Silicon Valley, hate to break it to you, man didn't come up with the idea of various different ways to communicate. God has been communicating in various and different ways from the beginning. In Hebrews 1.1, it says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, and at many times... And in various ways. God spoke in various and different ways. God spoke to Moses through a burning bush in Exodus 3. Anyone ever seen a burning bush? No? I have, but it wasn't speaking. It was just burning. But the one that Moses saw, it was actually speaking. God spoke to him through a burning bush. God spoke to Balaam through a donkey in Numbers chapter 22. Anyone ever been spoken to by a donkey? And I'm not including right now this moment. Okay? God spoke to Gideon through a fleece. He threw a, a towel on the ground, a fleece on the ground. He said, Lord, make it wet all around it and dry if it's you. And God did. And then the next day, he threw it out again and said, do the opposite. And God did. I don't know why I'm not encouraging you to do that. But hey, God spoke to a man once that way. And it's recorded in this collection of ancient documents we call the Bible. God spoke to Jonathan through circumstances. 1 Samuel 14, Jonathan says to God, I'm going to climb up this mountain with my armor bearer. And Lord, if it's you that that I should go up there and take them, then I want them to respond a certain way. And if it's not you, get them to respond another way. And of course, they responded a certain way. And Jonathan went, God, you've given them into my hands. And he jumps up there with his armor bearer and slays a whole bunch of the enemy. God spoke to Solomon in a dream. 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon's asleep. And God speaks to Solomon in a dream. Says you can have anything you want. Solomon, who must have already had a shandy of wisdom about him, turns around to God and says, I'll tell you what I'll have. I'll have wisdom. And it says, then he woke up because he was in a dream. God spoke to Elijah through a still small voice in the cleft of a cave, a rock. Still small voice. Anyone ever had God speak to them in a still small voice in their life? Just that little knowing, that gentle voice, that whisper in your spirit. You just know that, God, you're saying something. You're communicating something with me here. God spoke to Mary through an angel. God spoke to Belshazzar by writing on the wall with his finger. God spoke to the early believers through an inner peace. Remember in in, uh, Acts chapter 15 where they said it seemed good to us in the Holy Spirit. There's something going on in here. It seemed good to the Spirit and us. There's a sense of peace going on here. And they moved forward with what they felt like the Lord was saying. I remember as a new believer, I used to have a book by a guy called John White. Anyone remember John White? In the older generation, you would know John White. Yep, very deep books. When I first got saved, somebody gave me a book by John White called The Fight. If you can get your hands on it, get it. It was a fantastic book for a new believer. And I remember I would come home and uh, I'd I'd, I'd have questions and things going on and my prayer life to God was just like, like going back and forth with my best friend. I just talked to God as I would talk to anybody else and had some of the most beautiful, beautiful moments of communion with, with my heavenly father back in those days. And then, of course, we get a bit more advanced, don't we? We get more theologically trained and we get smarter and then we real, and somehow we lose that childlikeness. And I'd love to go back. I, I think we would all love to go back to that childlikeness, that beautifulness of that very first sense of intimacy we had with him. And I think the father wants that for us too. But I remember I would come home and I would get John White's book and I would open up John White's book and I would ask a question to God and I'd say, God, you're going to speak to me. I'd open the book literally and put my finger down. And guess what? I would look and guess what? God would speak to me. My finger would go on a line, a passage or something that John White was saying that answered my question. So much so that I used to write the date in that all the time. I don't know why. I'm not recommending you do that, by the way, because after a while I started doing it and I went, bang, Judas hung himself. That's, I think it's God. The next time, bang, you brood of vipers. I don't like that one either, God, you know. Let me strategically turn to something nice in the Psalms and put my fingers on that. I'll put the finger down first, then I'll ask the question. 
But God spoke to me that way. Why? Well, he's God and he can. I'm not recommending you do it, but I'm just saying this is where I was at in my journey with God and God spoke. God spoke to me once through a lobster. I'm sitting in a Chinese restaurant in Coffs Harbour with a, a, a handful of people from Balna. I became a Christian in Balna. I'm in Coffs Harbour sitting in a Chinese restaurant. And as I'm sitting there, uh, there's me, another person, three people there, and a fish tank behind them. And there's a lobster in the fish tank. And as I look at the lobster, I hear this voice. I want you to go and join the mission. The lobster spoke to me. That's not true. It wasn't really the lobster and it didn't sound like that. But God did say to me, I want you to go and join this organisation called Youth with a Mission. Clear as a bell. I was so stunned. I sat there the rest of the night almost mute. I felt like I couldn't talk to the people around me. They knew something was wrong and I I couldn't engage because I was so shocked. I heard this voice on the inside of me giving me direction for my life and saying, I want you to go and join this organisation. I ended up spending 12 years there with YWAM. Got a great foundation in my faith. So God can speak to us in any manner and method that he wants. And maybe, maybe God is speaking to you, but maybe you're pigeonholing him saying, this is my favorite method, God. I want you to speak to me this way. When God is trying to speak to you, maybe in different ways. Remember, it's God's prerogative to choose how he communicates to us. Amen? It's God's prerogative to choose how he communicates to us. And we need to be open to the fact that God will speak to us through his word. I believe that's the number one way that God confirms things. That's the, the, the word of God of the railway tracks. And I don't believe God will go outside of that. I believe that that's the ultimate confirmation of the things that the Lord would speak to me. But I also believe God can speak to me uh, uh, through a book I'm reading. God can speak to me through something I hear on a news report. God can speak to me through a song. He can speak to me through being in my backyard, watching the birds fly around. He can speak to me through creation. He can speak to me through a pastor, a friend, a leader. He can speak to me over coffee at the end of this service while we're eating a sausage. The word of the Lord can come to me. I want to be open to hear from God and receive from God. So maybe, maybe God is speaking to you, but you're just not open to the way and the method that he's choosing. Maybe he's not giving you the exact method you want, but I do believe that God is speaking to many of us. That's number four. Number five. So one, you don't believe it's possible to hear him. Number two, you don't know what he sounds like. Number three, you're hearing, but you're afraid to, it, you're afraid to acknowledge it might be him. Number four, he's not silent. He's just not communicating the way you want him to. Number five, maybe he's already answered your question. Maybe God's already answered your question and you're sitting there asking the same question and God's pulling his hair out. I'm sure God has hair in heaven. Owen's going to have hair. Uh, We're all going to have hair. Bevan, you'll get it all back. We're going to have hair in heaven. I've got no doubt about that. Maybe God's sitting up there going, you know what, I've already answered your question. I've already answered your question. How many of you know that we have this collection of ancient documents? This collection of ancient documents, 66 books written over 1,600 years on three separate continents by 27, I think, different authors. It's a miracle. And in that is compiled all the stuff that God wanted kept down until the moment it was written, until the time that he returns, that is there for us. How many of you know that that book has a lot to say about love, life, living, finance, parenting, uh, jobs, being a boss, being a, uh, somebody under a boss It speaks to you about authority, It speaks to you about anger. It speaks to you about grace. How many of you know that that collection of ancient documents has so much to say to us? God wants to speak to us and has spoken to us already. So much stuff that's already in that collection of ancient documents. Yet it's amazing statistically when you look at the latest uh, Pew Research statistics and Barna Research and so on that less and less people are spending any time at all picking up that collection of ancient documents and reading the Bible. Yet we wonder why it's getting harder and harder to hear God. Well, God has spoken very, very clearly through his word. There's the the known will of God right there in his word. And many of us don't take any time or see any need to prioritize the known will of God, the known word of God to us about our life. If we read the Bible, we'd be amazed at some of the things we've already been told about forgiving enemies, about serving your brothers and sisters in the Lord, about being generous, about giving to those in need if you have means, about not forgetting to gather together, about making integrous decisions, being a person of honour, about not cheating, not lying, not stealing, so on. There's so much stuff that God has already spoken to us. Sometimes I think we should be listening for no's rather than yeses sometimes. Sometimes we're sitting back saying, Lord, should I forgive this person? Well, God's already said forgive them. What we should be saying, is there any valid reason why I shouldn't? And you'll probably hear crickets. Because God's forgiven you. Most of us don't realise how gross and disgusting our own actions were in the sight of God before he forgave us. Because we kind of have this ratio, don't we? This level of sin and what's really good and what's really bad and what's acceptable and what's not. Yet James very clearly says, you broke one law of God. You've broken them all. You are guilty suckers. And God in his tremendous, tremendous grace wipes the slate clean. 
There's so much stuff in the Word of God that we uh, need to get into that Word. Because maybe God has already answered a question. Maybe you're asking him something that you've already answered. How many of you get frustrated? Let me ask you a question. How many of you, just as humans, get frustrated when somebody asks you a question and you've answered the question? Caleb says to me all the time, he's, he's, he's in his workplace, he said, Dad, they'll come and ask you a question. I'll answer it very simply. They'll go away, but they'll come back and they'll ask me the same question. It's almost like you keep asking the same question. Why? Maybe you're searching for a different answer. God's going, I don't have a different answer. I have the same answer I just gave you. There's my answer. So maybe you're struggling to hear God. Maybe because God's already answered you. Number six, maybe you're struggling to hear God, possibly struggling to hear God because you haven't done the last thing God said. A couple of nervous chuckles from the peanut gallery there. How many of you can sit back and say that, yep, I, when I think about the last thing God told me, I've done it. You know, I can tell you that I'm a procrastinator at heart. How many, anyone like me? Procrastinate? Yeah? There's a couple of you. The rest of you are going to take your time before you put your hand up, aren't you? You're just going to procrastinate about that one too. You haven't done the last thing that God said. What was the last thing that God spoke to you? What was the last instruction that you received from the Lord? You know, I used to ask my kids when my kids were young, I'd ask them to go and do things and sometimes they didn't do it. And then they'd come back to me and they'd ask for another job. My question would always be, well, did you finish what I just asked you to do? I, I asked you to clean your room. You're coming back asking for another job. Well, hang on, have you done the job I just... Uh, no. Well, go and do the job I just asked you to do. Would you go and finish the last thing that I told you to do? Why should I expect another word from God when I still haven't done the last thing he told me to do? Maybe some of us are sitting back going, God, give me the next thing. And God's saying, I've given you one thing and you haven't done that yet. Why don't you go and do that? And then I'll give you the next thing. I often wonder sometimes whether God holds back a little bit because he goes, look, I've, I've given you something. I've asked you to do something, given you an instruction, and you choose not to do it. You know it's me, you know I've said it, but you choose not to do it. The, the, the word for that is generally, if it was a child to a parent, we would have a word for that. What would it be? You are being disobedient is what we would call it. We would call it on a human level. You know what you're meant to do. The instruction's clear. You're choosing not to do it. We would say that's disobedient. And I'm not saying God thinks this way, but I wonder sometimes whether my heavenly father looks down at me and goes, Alan, I've asked you to do something. You didn't do it. You've put yourself in a category of being disobedient to me. I don't want to aid you in becoming disobedient again. Why would I give you another thing not to do? Why don't you just go and do the last thing that I spoke to you to do? In fact, listening in the Bible carries the inference of obeying. You ever notice that? You read these collection of ancient documents and most of the time when it talks about listening to God, the end result is not just the hearing of information, it's the application of what you heard. It's the doing of what was said to you. You forget to do. If you forget to do things in life, what do people generally say to you? Owen, Owen, will you uh, mow the lawn? And Owen doesn't mow the lawn. So what does Judy say? Why aren't you listening to me? The listening was connected to the doing. You didn't do something, so the assumption is you didn't do it because you're not listening. Because you're not listening. And so you don't do. And there's this connection between listening and doing, and we know that because that's how we treat others, and that's how we get treated in life. The boss says, I want you to do this, and you don't do it. Well, of course, the, the assumption at the end of the day is, well, you're not listening if you're not doing. But if you did, then we're assuming what? That you listened. There's this connection between listening and doing. And there's also a biblical connection between listening and doing. And, and Sarah shared this morning that great passage of the wise and foolish builder. Uh, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, and then again in verse 26, uh, Jesus starts by saying, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. In other words, there's a connection between hearing and doing. If you hear and do, you're wise. But then he goes on in verse 26, says, but everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice is a foolish man. Again, there's a connection between hearing and doing, hearing and doing, hearing and doing. And the hearing and doing is a wise person. The hearer who doesn't do is a foolish person. This is what Jesus said. A man once said this. He said, my dog is very obedient. I say to it, are you coming or not? And it comes or it doesn't. And sometimes that's what we think obedience is, isn't it? You know? You can pick either side of the fence and God's going to be happy with either of them. Yet the Bible story is very, very clear that God wants his children to be obedient. The end game is not to fill our heads with knowledge and information, but that knowledge and information is leading us towards some kind of action. And are we the kinds of people that follow through with that kind of action? If Jesus is truly the Lord of our lives, 
then we don't give ourselves the option of come or don't, and they do or they don't. We, we know that the Lord wants us to obey him. He wants us to walk in what he's called us to do. He wants us to do it, what, what, what he's told us to do. There's a flow-on effect from that. God gets glory. And that's the end game. We've spoken about this a few weeks ago. God wants our lives to bring glory to him, not to me. It's not about me, not about me looking great, not about me building a great... It's, that's all a byproduct of obedience. That's all wonderful. And God will take care of all that stuff. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I want to obey God because I want to bring glory to God. Obedience is the final step in the hearing process. And if we don't have obedience, then I wonder whether we've either truly heard or... We have heard, but we're choosing disobedience. And I don't want to be that person in the hands of God or in the church or in life. I don't want to be that person that deliberately treats the word of God and what God has to say to me as something that I can just cherry pick, pick and choose, or something that that I have that much disregard for. It doesn't really matter whether I do it. Jesus said, my words are spirit and life. There's something about the communication of Jesus, something so incredibly precious, spiritual and powerful. And it's not just information for information's sake. And the last one, last reason why you may possibly not be hearing from God. Last one for today, because he wants to develop your faith. God wants to develop your faith. Let me ask you a question. Can you trust God when you feel like you're hearing nothing? Can you trust God when you feel like God is silent? And you have nothing but faith to press into. You don't have a goosebump. You don't have a scripture verse that's jumping off the page at you. You don't have people ringing you up and saying and, and pointing. And All you're hearing is crickets. Do you have faith? We sang a song this morning about the goodness of God. Do we believe in the goodness of God? When we don't have anything visible to attach that to. Peter wrote to a bunch of believers who were experiencing persecution in this life. 1 Peter 1, verse 6 and 7, and here's what he said. He said, In all this you greatly rejoice. These guys were under persecution for their faith. He says, Though for now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Sometimes when you feel like you're not hearing from God, getting the goosebumps, it can feel like a trial. It can feel like something that's not, uh, it's not a good feeling. It's not something you would naturally choose for yourself, yet it's happening. You're suffering grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that what? The proven genuineness of your faith. Now, here's what I want you to see, which is of greater worth than gold. Did you, have you ever thought that the most valuable resource you have down here on planet Earth, from the day you were born to the day you depart and be with Jesus, the most valuable asset and resource you have on planet Earth is your faith? Peter's saying your faith is worth more than gold. It's worth way more than gold. Yet if we had a chance to make more gold, eh? we have a chance to make more gold, we will press into that chance. We will take the risks. We will put up with stuff. To make more gold. Yet Paul says here, your faith is worth way more than gold. Do we press into those moments for the building of our faith? Can we press into those? Can we go through the trials and the things, the temptations, the sufferings, whatever it is, to see that faith grow? I mean, men and women, mate, we will work 80 hours a week to bring in an extra X amount of dollars, won't we? We want a holiday, we'll just say to our family, well, you know what, I won't see you for the next month because I'm going to be working three jobs, raise, and, 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 and we will chase after that stuff and we will prioritise and so on. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it's, it's fine. What I'm saying, though, is that with the same value that we will put up with and deal with and wrestle and so on with to get gold, to get money, to get fame, fortune, popularity, whatever it might be, do we have that same attitude toward our faith? Because Peter's saying here to these people that, that the faith you have is worth more than any of that other stuff. It's going to do you way better throughout the course of your life than any of that other material stuff ever will. So build your faith. Have you ever thought that your most valuable resource down here is your faith, not your money? And Hebrews eleven six, we all know this one. Without faith, it's kind of difficult to please God. Without faith, you might have a struggle to please God. It doesn't say that, does it? It says, without faith, it's what? Impossible. In the Greek language, that word impossible, the Greek language is much more sort of colourful and, and thought out than, than English. Is quite, English is quite bland. Our language is like our food. It's just quite bland. 
That's why I love Indian and Asian and all these other types of food. But just give me some spice any day. But in the Greek, that word impossible literally means without strength, impotent, powerless, weak and disabled. In other words, your faith is powerless, without strength, weak and disabled. If you have that kind of a faith, you're saying it's impossible. Please God. Now, if it's impossible to please God without faith, then doesn't it make sense that God is going to orchestrate things in your life to build faith and to put you in a place where you're walking in faith? Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. He wants you to please him. So I'm going to make sure that there's moments in your life where you need to walk in faith and develop faith because without that, you can't please me. And I want you to please me, so I'm going to make sure that you end up in moments and situations. Can you see the cycle? You're either going through something that's building your faith now, coming out of something that's just built your faith, or about to go into something that's going to build your faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Who's happy about that? God wants to build our faith. Without faith, it's impossible. If many of us are honest with ourselves, we want a Christian experience devoid of risk, uncertainty, and doubt. And we want a Christian life that's predictable, controllable, full of goosebumps and guarantees. In short, we want a Christianity devoid of faith. But that's impossible, people. That is impossible. And before you start feeling like you might be the only one in this room who's experiencing the faith-building power of hearing nothing, think about King David, who, by the way, was a man after God's own heart. Psalm 13, verse 5 to 6. This is coming from King David. I might get the worship, guys, if you hear. Jump back up. Psalm 13, verse 5 and 6. Listen to David. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? Sounds like somebody that feels like God's at a distance, doesn't it? I'm not hearing from you, Lord. Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? Sounds like a man who feels distant from God. Sounds like a man who's not hearing at the moment. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Then in verse 3, he says, Look on me and answer God. Come on, when will you answer me, Lord? I'm asking these questions. I've got these. God, when will you answer? Come on, look at me. God, I'm here. I feel like you're looking everywhere else. I feel like you're answering everybody else. But God, do you know I'm here? I'm right here. Look at me, Lord. Look at me and answer me. Give light to my eyes or I'll sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I've overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Right now I'm living in how long, how long, how long? Lord, here I am. Why are you not looking at me? Why are you not answering? Even though that's happening, God, I have enough faith in me to say this. In the midst of that, I'm still going to stand up and say, but God, you are good to me. And I'm never going to forget that even in the midst of the struggle and the trial. I had a situation some years ago, and some of you may remember this. I've shared it before. I was in Brisbane, and we were going through a very difficult time of life before we transitioned out of one ministry setting into another. And uh, there was a lot of things happening that were out of our control, and I felt like, God, where are you? How long? Lord, how long until I feel a goosebump again? How long till I hear your voice? How long till I feel that, that sweetness of, God, how long? How long? Answer me, God. Here I am. And one day I came home from work and Jackie was getting dinner ready in the kitchen. We had the three kids at the time, the three boys. And I walked up to the, put my bag down and said to Jackie, look, I'll take the kids around the corner of this little park there. I'll go around the corner to the park. I'll play with the kids. And Jackie, you uh, get dinner ready without the kids running around your feet. You know? She said, that would be fantastic. So I did. I grabbed the kids, my three boys, and we walked down to the park. Get down to the park and we're playing for a little while. I looked at my watch, realised, okay, dinner's probably nearly ready now. Let's begin the journey back home. And I said to the boys, come on, let's go. And they said to me, no, Dad, let's play hide and seek. Now, let me paint a picture for you. We're in a park. There's a tree. There's a slippery dip and a swing. That's it. And when I'm talking slippery dip, I'm talking, you know, the, the thin metal bar that goes up with the aluminium slide. They don't have them in parks anymore because you don't want to get sued. Kids used to get third degree burns on them, slide halfway down, stop, and it was 60 degrees like they were sitting on a barbecue hot plate. I'm thinking, slippery dip, tree swing. I felt like falling on my knees and saying, Lord, where have I failed? Are you boys seeing what I'm seeing? It's a, you know, yeah, but we want to play hide and seek. It's like, okay, no worries. So they said, Dad, you count to, to 100 and we'll hide. I said, no worries. One, two, three, four, blah, blah, 99. Ready or not, here I come. 
And I ran out and I start, obviously I opened up my eyes and I look around. And what do you think I saw when I looked around? I saw a tree, a slippery dip, and a swing. And I'm thinking, there's no way they could hide behind the slippery dip. I mean, you know, they're skinny kids, but not that skinny. And of course, the swing, a piece of rubber on a chain, they've got to be behind the tree. But I thought, here's what I'll do. I'm a good father. I'll have a bit of fun with my kids. So I went, oh, boys, I wonder where they are. I wonder where they could be. And I heard this chuckling from behind the tree. Oh, dad's an idiot. Oh. I said, I wonder if they're behind the slippery dip. And I jumped behind the pole and there's nobody there. And the kids are going, oh, dad, what a clown. I said, no. I said, maybe they're under the swing. And I grabbed the swing and I lifted the swing and there's no kids under the swing. And the kids are chuckling away behind the tree. Then I thought, wonder if they're in the grass and I'm doing this to the grass. And the kids are chuckling and laughing. And then finally I thought, okay, I've had my fun with the kids. I said, I wonder if they're behind the tree and I jumped behind the tree and I went, ah, and the kids went, ah, and we rolled around the grass and cuddled and laughed and chuckled and all kinds of things. After about 30 seconds, we got up, we brushed the grass off and I said to the kids, come on, let's go home. And they said, no, no, Dad, it's your turn to hide now. And I'm thinking, where did I go wrong, Lord Jesus? Seriously. So right here, no worries, I will hide. You guys count to 100. So they did. Okay, we're going to count to 100. 1, 21, 94, 77, 26, 88, 90. Ready or not, here we come. And I'm sure, although I've never asked them, when they opened their eyes, they saw something similar to this. A tree, a slippery dip, and a swing. But they decided to run over to the slippery dip, and they're looking around the pole, and they're going, he's not here. And I'm behind the tree thinking, geez, I hope you're mucking around. (laughs) Or I'm back to the drawing board. There goes all that education, you know, out the window. Then they run over to the the, the swing, and they did the same thing, lifting up like I did. And they're looking around. Then they're looking in the grass. And something interesting happened. They're calling out, Dad, Dad, Dad. Hey, Dad, Dad. But then there was a moment where the whole thing changed. The tone changed. Dad, Dad, Dad. 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 Daddy. Dad. I could tell. They had no idea. And I started to pick up the concern in their voice. So from behind the tree, I went, made some stupid bird noise. And they went, maybe he's behind the tree. I'm thinking, you reckon? (laughs) So they come running behind the tree. They went, oh, I went, oh, we rolled around the grass for around 30 seconds. We got up, brushed the grass off. I grabbed the hand and said, come on, boys, we've got to get home now. Dinner's got to be ready. And as we're walking home, my oldest son, Caleb, said this to me. He said, Dad, I was getting really, really scared because I couldn't see you. And without even thinking, these words came out of my mouth. It doesn't matter, son. I could see you. And in that moment, it's like the drought broke for me and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, Alan, that's real faith, isn't it? Real faith is not the fact that you can always see God, that you always hear God, that you know what God is doing all the time. That's not real faith. Real faith is trusting in the fact that whether you can see or not, whether you feel or not, whether you're hearing or not, Your Father is always watching you. And He's always there. And praise God for the moments we get the goosebumps. And praise God for the moments we get the clarity of communication. Praise God for those moments. God wants to build our faith. And maybe it's possible for some people in this room here, maybe it's possible that you're not hearing from God at the moment because maybe God's wanting to build your faith. Maybe God's wanting to build your faith in this room. We're going to sing that song, Goodness of God. I want to finish with that song. Two reasons. Number one, maybe that's you here this morning. And maybe you are struggling. You're that person. The goosebumps are gone. The feelings are gone. You're feeling like you're not hearing from God. Maybe you're punishing yourself. Maybe you're searching around thinking it must be me. I don't know whether it is or isn't, but I do want to say this. Sometimes it's not you. Sometimes it's your father. Wanting you to build trust, wanting you to realize that real faith is not about you knowing where he is, it's the fact that he knows where you are all the time. You might not be able to see him, but I'll tell you this, he's seeing you right now. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, right now your heavenly father can see it. And he's got a way better vision of it than you do. And he loves you and he's with you. And that's real faith. And maybe God's building faith in your life. The second reason 
is because we have been here for eight years. And that's pretty cool. And God's been very, very good to us. And there are people in this room that in those eight years, you have experienced the goodness of God. God has done great things for you. And normally we don't, uh, we're not probably the most on the ball church in terms of celebrating birthdays and so on. Personally, I forget most birthdays on planet Earth. I've got a diary called Jackie over there and she reminds me of all the significant moments and dates. But we want to acknowledge in this place this morning as well the goodness of God. God has been very, very good to us here at Arise. He's been very good to us as a gathering. Uh, he will continue to be good to us. But we want to sort of finish our service this morning by fixing our attention, our gaze on the goodness of God. So whether you be a person that this morning wants to remember the goodness of God and thank God for His goodness uh, in your journey or so on, or maybe you're a person here this morning and you just want to thank God for His goodness because even though you don't feel it, but you know. Maybe today, hopefully, you realize God is with you. He's for you, not against you. And whether you can see Him or not, that's not the point. He can see you this morning in this place.